a little cloudy, but it's supposed to be a beautiful day, Monday, uh, Friday, the end of the week, May 15th. Um, and it's very, very good to see Dr. Fuster back in familiar surroundings. If you could peep at his little video screen. Um, today um, is going to be one of the highlights, I think, of our COVID curriculum. Um, I think that um, people have been really very satisfied with the conferences even being put on in Zoom, and some prefer Zoom because they can do it from wherever they are. Um, we actually have documented more attendance than we typically have. But today is particularly in, in important um, because it's a source of so much uh, controversy. And when I asked Dr. Halpern to chair this um, a few days ago, he said that it's going to change minute to minute. Um, so be prepared. Um, and I think there isn't any uh, better panel to deal with those type of uh, minute to minute changes um, than the really extraordinary panel um, that Dr. Halpern uh, has helped put together. Uh, Kevin Troy, uh, many of you know, is a go-to hematologist here, clinically uh, a superb a hematologist in the field of hematology and many, uh, medical oncology, um, has great expertise in the field, both clinically and research. Andrew Dunn, uh, many of you know, uh, wears many different hats, is professor of medicine, um, he actually leads uh, the Division of Hospital Medicine in the Department of Medicine. His research interests include anticoagulation and thrombosis, specifically venous thrombosis, atrial fibrillation, and perioperative management, and actually has led a multi-center North American study on perioperative management of oral anticoagulation. He was a former chair of the American uh, College of Physicians Board of Regents. Dr. Jeff Olin, uh, needs a little introduction uh, to this group. Is uh, the director of vascular medicine and vascular diagnostic lab here at Mount Sinai. Is professor of medicine. Um, he is internationally renowned as an expert in the field of vascular medicine, and certainly has been a pioneer um, in putting the vascular into cardiovascular medicine. He was past president and one of the founding members of the American Board of uh, Vascular Medicine and the past president of Society of Vascular Medicine has gotten every major award uh, in the field. Uh, Vivek Reddy um, also wears many different um, job descriptions. He is a Helmsley Professor um, of Mount Sinai Heart, Director of Cardiac Arrhythmia Service, is one of the uh, nation's premier electrophysiologists, particularly in the area of atrial fibrillation. Um, he has uh, been the pioneer in so many technological um, discoveries. Um, first lead author in so many um, seminal articles in the field, particularly in the technology, and has probably the most frequent flyer miles of anyone in cardiology outside of Dr. Fuster. And the moderator today, really very honored to have Dr. Halpern. Uh, Robert and Harriet Kyle Bloom, Professor of Medicine at Mount Sinai, Director of Clinical Cardiac uh, Services. He um, educated Columbia. Uh, Dr. Fuster recruited him way back to help up uh, start the clinical services here. He's also Director of Mount Sinai's Urban Community Cardiology Fellowship Program. He leads the cardiology clinics here. Um, any um, clinical trial in the past 20 or more years that has dealt with atrial fibrillation and pharmacology. Uh, Dr. Uh, Halpern has either led uh, or been on the panel of leaders forming it, describing it, um, and we're thrilled that he's going to lead today uh, this panel discussion. Uh, Dr. Halpern, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. And I uh, also, of course, I'm delighted that Dr. Fuster has agreed to join this panel as well today. And he not only needs uh, no introduction, but until the COVID shutdown, he had uh, enough frequent flyer miles to travel to the sun. Um, now, could I just ask him, how do I get this, this slide? I, I click so slide. On the bottom of the screen, go to share screen. Yep. And then I go to that. Okay. Can you see his slides? It's close. Yes. How we do uh, Okay, very good. Okay. So um, again, thanks everyone for joining. I don't know, is Kevin Troy on the line or, or not? 
I'm not sure if he was able to join. I hope so, but uh, we'll find out. So, uh, my, of course, let me again disclose that I've been involved in developing a lot of the so-called no X, and so I'm conflicted in that respect. But uh, I don't um, even know what I did. But there we go. There we go. Um, so, so let me just quickly take a few minutes to kind of set the stage for our discussion today um, and review some of the um, abnormalities of hemostasis uh, that are so uh, frequent in patients with uh, COVID-19. Uh, we know that there's impaired uh, fibrinolysis, elevated fibrinogen, and factor VIII levels. There's a lot of crosstalk between the intrinsic and extrinsic, that's the contact uh, pathways of coagulation. Elevated D-dimers in particular are associated with an elevated risk uh, uh, for the need for mechanical ventilation, for ICU admission, and for mortality in this disease. Um, we know that uh, the common findings- on mute, unless you're Dr. Halpern right now, please put your phone on mute. Thank you. Um, very common to see uh, mild disturbances of uh, cellular components like thrombocytopenia, but much more variable responses in terms of the thrombin time, the INR, the uh, TT or thrombin time or the APTT. Uh, sometimes they become quite elevated, but in other cases, really minimally affected. Uh, the majority of uh, non-survivors meet the ISTH uh, criteria for DIC, compared to a very small minority of those who survive. So there's a lot that's DIC-like in this sy syndrome, uh, but overlaps are limited as well in some respects. Um, we, we believe that the inflammatory release of cytokines, uh, particularly interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha, promotes the expression of tissue factor from monocytes. I'll have more to say about that in just a moment, as well as from endothelial cells. And this creates a burst of thrombin. So at least theoretically, thrombin inhibition could prevent these thrombotic events that are so often the cause of death in patients with COVID-19. The non-survivors, as we know, are typically obese. They have pre-existing cardiac disease or hypertension or diabetes. We know from early post-mortem studies that have followed these patients that there is a three-phase um, pattern to this illness, which begins with the early infectious stage, pulmonary infiltrates, and ultimately a severe systemic inflammatory response that has major pulmonary and cardiac manifestations. The interstitial pneumonia involves diffuse alveolar damage, and I'll have some more to say in a moment about the impact of lung damage in particular on coagulation, and this is coupled as well with a microangiopathy that's thrombos thrombotic as well as the large um, venous thromboembolic events that we, uh, we see. The heart, as we have discussed in many of our conferences, uh, is typically involved with cardiomyocyte injury. In some cases, pericarditis or myocarditis occur. The anatomic involvement of other organs varies quite a bit, but includes uh, lymphocytic and plasmacytic infiltrates and infarcts that are both large and small. And many of these findings correlate with clinical manifestations of endothelial dysfunction, as well as primary thrombosis. The big issue I think we need to address today is the matter of pulmonary embolism. Um, we see it frequently, and, and there have been early autopsy reports that um, show the occurrence of both deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. And clinically, everyone who's been involved in caring for the acutely ill patient with this disease has at least faced the threat of this major complication. Let me just give you a little bit of experience that I think uh, is both frightening and, and humbling. Um, this is a study from the Netherlands in three hospitals of nearly 200 patients, all of whom had been receiving either prophylactic or more intensive anticoagulant therapy and looked at the uh, incidence of various thromboembolic events, both venous and arterial, with a cumulative incidence of 31% in people who had received anticoagulant therapy to some extent in intensity while they were in the ICU. These were all ICU patients with a mortality of 13%. There are a number of such reports. Here's one, uh, another one from the Netherlands, this one from a single hospital in Amsterdam that looked at the incidence of uh, venous thrombosis in patients who are on the general medical wards compared to those in the intensive care unit. And obviously, the more intensively um, cared for patients that were more critically ill had a dramatically higher incidence of venous thromboembolism compared to the typical patients that were 
less critically ill. This is, of course, not surprising, but the overall incidence is striking. These, again, are patients who, for the most part, were receiving low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis, uh, and so it's not an entirely effective strategy to do that. There's a, a, a correspondence report coming out in Jack, I think very soon, that uh, looked at uh, patients at one hospital in France, in Paris, where they did serial venous ultrasound studies <clears throat> at the time of admission to the ICU. And what they found was an overall 46% incidence of patients developing uh, evidence of venous thrombosis in the lower limbs. These patients were studied within two days of admission to the ICU, and then every five uh, days or so afterwards. And you'll see not only a high incidence of venous thromboembolism, but actually about half of those were proximal uh, DVTs involving the iliofemoral segments above the knee. So those carry the highest risk of pulmonary embolism and not only the highest incidence of pulmonary embolism, but the worst outcomes because of the severity of those uh, pulmonary events. And so we can see a problem, a pattern here emerging. We all encountered it. And one of the frustrating things is the lack of apparent complete efficacy of antithrombotic strategies. So what's going on here? We know that pneumonia due to a severe COVID-19 is associated with a systemic hyperinflammatory response that we call cytokine storm. It's also known as the macrophage activation syndrome. COVID-19 infection with this macrophage activation typically occurs in patients who have ARDS and those who do not survive with ARDS uh, we see an association with sustained elevations of IL-6 and IL-1, but there are important differences between ARDS and this macrophage activation syndrome that have potential relevance to the timing and the impact of anti-cytokine therapy with respect to viral clearance, pulmonary mac macrophage activation, and pulmonary vascular complications, including thrombosis. Uh, the important component of endothelial dysfunction also promotes thrombosis and might account for the observation that even administering potent thrombolytic therapy to those in whom we suspect pulmonary embolism may only transiently improve the situation, and these people typically still do badly. This is a nice paper from uh, Miriam Mayrod of our institution that looks at the issue of infl inflammation-induced coagulation, uh, which is mediated by activation of the tissue factor pathway. Tissue factors expressed by mononuclear cells in response to these cytokines, mainly IL-6 and TNF-alpha, but it's also expressed on vascular endothelial cells and promotes the transformation of prothrombin into thrombin. In addition, there are major na natural anticoagulant and fibrinolytic pathways, including antithrombin and tissue factor pathway inhibitor that are impaired during inflammation, and this could contribute to the prothrombotic state in the absence of vascular injury, initiation of coagulation depends on recruiting tissue factor expressing monocytes by activated endothelial cells. Tissue factor is a clearly an important mediator of what goes on, and this raises questions of two sorts. First of all, lung injury is among the worst kinds of injury that you can have from a thrombotic standpoint because of the cytokine storm. And secondly, we have believed since the NOACs or the target-specific oral anticoagulants were introduced that they may have less activity in situations when tissue factor is activated. This may account for why they seem protective against brain hemorrhage because it may be an insult to humanity, but our brains are mostly fat and tissue fat. And the fact that they may have less ability to inhibit tissue factor than drugs like warfarin and heparin might account for why they produce less brain hemorrhage, but it may potentially indicate less uh, efficacy in COVID-19 associated situations. Now, what about platelets? As you can see, platelets have a potential role, both related to the endothelial injury and to the activation of thrombin, but we have very little information on whether platelet inhibition is going to be a useful strategy here. In fact, I haven't seen much. There's a small study from China in which dipyridamol uh, suppressed viral replication in vitro, and there were 31 patients in whom when they added dipyridamol to other therapies, it was associated with lower levels of D-dimers, increased lymphocyte and platelet counts, and 
seem to improve clinical outcomes, but these have not been replicated results. I've seen no other published studies of platelet inhibitor treatment for patients with COVID-19. If you could think about the intensity of thrombin generation in response to cytokines in, in patients with COVID-19 pneumonia, it seems unlikely that platelet inhibitor therapy alone will be effective, but whether it should be part of a combined antithrombotic regimen is an important unanswered question. And before we get into the specifics of uh, patient management and evaluation, let me just say one more thing about mechanisms. Inflammation, as we know, that mediates hypercoagulability and impaired fibrinolysis involves a, a number of pathways, and studies are needed to systematically evaluate this in patients with this disease, perhaps by incorporating parallel biobanking of blood as a translational component in future trials. Antiphospholipid antibody mechanisms need to be explored, including the possibility of antiprotein S, antiprotein C, antithrombin antibodies, which are known to cause ischemic stroke in children who have systemic varicella. Antibodies to complement proteins, proteins S and C, or antithrombin have been described in DIC, leading to vascular disruption that exposes tissue factor from the subendothelial tissue. Anticardiolipin antibody syndromes have been associated with an impaired response to rivaroxaban, leading to the equivalent of a black box warning against the use of any of the NOACs in Europe for patients who have certain anticardiolipin antibodies. So we have a lot of reason to be uncertain about what might be the optimum antithrombotic strategy in patients with COVID-19. So with that as a background, let me, uh, we have a, a, on our panel uh, two or three people who were involved in the development of the Mount Sinai antithrombotic therapy protocol. And before we invite them to comment, uh, let me just, uh, you've all seen this, it's been distributed. Uh, you know, the first order of business is to evaluate the patient clinically, and the recommendations are shown here, asking that we assess the patients for venous thromboembolic risk factors or signs or symptoms of actual DVT or pulmonary embolism, to assess how sick they are clinically, and to assess their risk of bleeding. And once that's done, we then move on to the matter of what's the appropriate prophylactic or treatment intensity and type of antithrombotic therapy. And before we ask Dr. Dunn and Dr. Troy, Dr. Fuster to comment on that protocol, I'd like to, uh, Jeff Olin, if you would, Jeff, to comment on uh, a, a protocol that you've proposed uh, at, at Dr. Fuster's invitation is under review currently at the institutional level for evaluating patients who are admitted with COVID-19 but are not in the ICU. So Jeff, I, I, you and I talked about this. I'll let you describe. Okay, thank you, John. That was a great review. Um, if I could ask everyone to please mute their phones, there's a lot of extraneous noise uh, coming through. Thank you. So I, um, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this, and I uh, submitted a uh, proposed protocol to Dr. Dunn and his committee to see if we can institute this. Um, it's clear from the information that Dr. Halpern presented that the very, very sick patients, those in the ICU and those on ventilators, have a um, very high prevalence of deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. They also have a lot of microthrombosis in the lung, as alluded to. What we don't know is, what about the patients who are sick enough to be in the hospital, but not sick enough to be in the ICU, and then after that information is gathered, we could even take it a step further. What about the patients who are at home um, with COVID-19 infection? Uh, what is their risk? Because this disease, more than any other condition that I'm aware of, produces extremely high levels of D-dimer, uh, which as you know, is the breakdown product of cross-linked fiber. So the questions, that come up are, what is the incidence of deep venous thrombosis among those who are hospitalized outside of the ICU setting? Does earlier identification of DVT improve outcomes? In other words, if everyone is getting, in, in some of the previous studies, most of the patients were on um, uh, prophylact at least prophylactic doses of anticoagulation. So does identifying DVT and then starting uh, full-dose anticoagulation improve outcomes. Uh, 
people on anticoagulation have a lower mortality than people who are not on anticoagulation. A number of studies have looked at this. Are there any biomarkers associated with a higher incidence of DVT? And what role do the genetic markers play in the risk of DVT, such as factor V vitamin prothrombin gene mutation 20210A? Next slide, John, please. So this is our proposal that when a patient is that working with Bruce Darrow in IT, that in the order set, um, if this is approved by the committee, we would um, an order would be placed for a venous duplex ultrasound by the vascular lab. We would do this venous duplex ultrasound on the day of admission, if possible, or the following day because we don't want to give whatever anticoagulation is going to be administered to affect the results. And we would do bilateral compression ultrasonography from the distal external iliac vein to the, um, to the ankle, essentially. Now, what's the uh, sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive value of ultrasound in symptomatic patients it's extraordinarily high, above 90-some percent. In asymptomatic patients, such as uh, routine use after post-total hip replacement or something like that, the sensitivity goes down somewhat. But we believe that um, with the current equipment that we have, we are able to visualize the calf veins in um, great detail. And we think that the sensitivity is really quite high uh, uh, even in the asymptomatic patient. If the patient does not have a DVT, we propose repeating the venous duplex ultrasound every five to seven days until discharge. Um, there are some studies that have suggested that those who did not initially have a DVT then develop it. Now, what about blood assays? Are there predictors of those who will develop a DVT? And we propose five blood tests. D-dimer, which is routinely obtained on most of these patients anyway. C-reactive protein is obtained on most patients. Factor VIII levels have been associated with acute thrombosis and with a predisposition to recurrent thrombosis. Factor V widening mutation is a genetic mutation that has a prevalence of about 7% of uh, Western and Eastern European heritage uh, for Asians and African Americans is very, very rare. And prothrombin gene mutation has a prevalence of uh, about 2 to 3% in that same population. Next, please. So the data we would um, collect are, does this kind of program affect days to discharge? Does it affect those who ultimately go to the intensive care unit or require mechanical ventilatory support? Does it affect in hospital mortality? Is it associated with readmissions after 30 days? And what is the status of the patient at 30 days? Um, I think that's the last slide, isn't it, John? It, it is. It is. Thanks for taking us through that. And hopefully we'll have time for a discussion of this protocol, which we hope we'll be able to implement uh, very um, soon. John, yes. but he didn't say or you didn't say what medicine you would give if they did have the DVD. And we're going to talk about that, um, I think, as the next step. Literally, the next topic is what are we doing in terms of antithrombotic therapy? So if you don't mind, I was going to ask our panelists, particularly Dr. Troy, if he's on, and Dr. Dunn, and Dr. Fuster, who are all part of the group that developed uh, this protocol, um, to step through it. There's a series of slides. They are lifted exactly from the, uh, from the protocol. And um, perhaps we can, I'll just you know, mention what it is. But Andy, if you're there, or is Kevin sure. on the line? I, I, you might be muted if you're there. So... It, if, Ke if Kevin's not, uh, Andy, if you're there, you want to take us yeah. quickly through this? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank yes. you. Uh, thank you. Well, glad, glad to participate, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so as, as mentioned, I'm the chief of the, the hospitalists, and you know, at the peak of the, of the crisis, we were up to 490 COVID patients on the medicine wards, which is just an incredible number. And I never dreamed that my research interest in anticoagulation would s somehow intersect with this massive influx of severely ill patients, but it, but it has. And I'm just going to take a half a step back. 
uh, you know, as people realize, we've been throwing the kitchen sink at COVID since we started seeing it. And that's mostly because patients do so poorly. I mean, that is a, quite a spectrum. We have patients at home. We have patients who do go home pretty rapidly. And we have a lot of patients who are here for quite a while and get very sick or, or die. And, you know, the gamut of evidence-free medicine has been practiced from hydroxychloroquine, which ends up probably not being effective, remdesivir, maybe some efficacy, the IL-6 antagonists, steroids, which probably not helpful, anticoagulation, hypermuglobulin, you name it. So, and, and this is all in an effort to somehow slow the course and reverse course for these patients. We know that once they go to the ICU and once they get intubated, the prognosis is not very good. You know, with maybe 25% of them walking out of the hospital, 25% dying, and many becoming chronically critically traits. So we're sort of fairly desperate to do something for these patients. And when it became evident that BTE was a big part of it, um, you know, that spurred a lot of the, um, you know, interest in, in anticoagulating. So, um, and that was just great clinical acumen by a lot of leaders recognizing the importance there, whether it's frank thrombosis or microthrombi. So initially our protocol emphasized standard prophylaxis for some, full dose anticoagulation for, for many, including IV heparin. So I was on that work group, and now I, I co-chair the latest version. I can just tell you from the initial uh, version, um, we anecdotally were seeing more intracranial hemorrhage. So I do want to come back to the harm piece of it, because the benefit piece of anticoagulation is completely unknown. You know, uh, uh, Jeff mentioned there's some data suggesting maybe a mortality benefit. We're waiting for really good data to find that, waiting for maybe even for RCT data to find that, but the data is observational so far. So the benefit is somewhat unknown. The harm is clear, because we know full dose anticoagulation causes harm. That's a given. Uh, and it can even cause intracranial hemorrhage. And I, I remember seeing, I, I review every single case, five of them that were due only to the protocol. There were others, they had other reasons for being on anticoagulation. Uh, but there was at least, there's been at least five where the only indication was our protocol. So we, we know we're gonna do a little bit of harm, just sobering. So we hope we're doing some good. The second version um, of the protocol ramped up the hopefully least harmful piece, which is prophylaxis. So the, uh, we've, we've gone to basically orthopedic dose prophylaxis, which is an oxyparin 30 twice a day uh, and increased to 40 if you're, you know, for uh, the morbidly obese. So that's already, I think, a very positive step because the, the harm there is probably small uh, and the benefit there is potentially more substantial, recognizing that standard dose prophylaxis is probably maybe not that optimal here. So let me, before you go further, Andy, just ask that, you know, make one point that perhaps Jeff could emphasize. So as you notice in the protocol, it, it, we've, or it's been recommended that for people who cannot be anticoagulated, that, a ser you know, a sequential uh, external compression of the lower limbs. Um, and Jeff, there, there's an important caveat, I think, about this, is there not? Yes, um, it, it's, it's important that that not be instituted unless you've excluded DVT. I mean, so in other words, you need to have an ultrasound before you start doing external compression. Or there right. Could be an I mean, under normal circumstances like total hip or knee replacement, you would just do it. Right. But because the prevalence is so high in this, we think, I think it's important to exclude DVT. I don't know if you agree, Andy, or not. Yeah. I think it's definitely a consideration. Um, there was one study that just came out of, and this conflicts with all the data that's been, that's been come out so far, including the, the great review by Jonathan, uh, by Cataneo in Italy. It was a non-ICU patients, 388, none of which had symptomatic DVT. They did four, 64 screening sonos and all were negative. I, think, I, I don't think our patients in Mount Sinai are non-ICU patients. If anyone's walked through 10 West, which is not an ICU, it sure looks like that. And so yeah. I, I do think our patients are very inflamed and very sick. And I think getting a SONO there before putting an SUD is a very reasonable thing to do. The, the other consideration, Andy, I think that, that shines through this whole protocol, and I have all the steps of the protocol here, is that this was developed really when we were, as you say, at the peak of this uh, pandemic in New York. And there was a, uh, you know, real concerns about not only staff exposure, but the complexities of dose adjustment and frequent administration that, I, in my sense, it influenced on some of the choices that were made. Uh, so that when you have patients on the wards uh, who start to get sick, 
that's when, I, and you might want to comment about this, is when um, you intensify the antithrombotic, but still tend to favor a low molecular weight heparin, um, except in patients with renal impairment. Yeah, uh, th that was a very big consideration from the start. In fact, uh, the recommendation for IV, there was a lot of uh, momentum for IV heparin initially because it has decreased, you know, can decrease some of the interleukins, interleukin-6, maybe some theoretical mm -hmm. benefit. Uh, but obviously, it's a lot of dose adjustment and yeah. a lot of lab draws. So the, initially, uh, people, that was sort of first line in the ICUs. And just, again, anecdotally, a little more associated with bleeding. So we have moved towards simpler, more predictable dosing with the low molecular weight heparins. Okay, so that's what we do for patients as they get sicker. When they're in the ICU, um, again, more intensive therapy, it seems. Um, and, and I think there was a thrombolytic trial ongoing. I don't know the status of that, do you? Yeah, human poor uh, study on thrombolysis. No, I, I don't know, I know he was enrolling patients, but. Heard an update. Yeah, I haven't heard any update about where things yeah. stand with that. Yeah, Jeff? he um, a paper was accepted for publication. Um, I forget the journal. Um, not a terribly high impact journal, like with six patients. And w what seemed to happen with these people are that their PCO2s rise. Um, they can't oxygenate well. They give them a bolus and a drip of TPA. They improve for two or three days or four days, and then they decompensate yeah. again. Yeah, that's been the experience, that it's not a lastingly beneficial intervention. Uh, right. Exactly what mediates that's not clear. This is Omesh Gidwani. I have oh, hi. a couple, hi, how are you? couple of questions and a comment. Yesterday, I presented uh, some CDs at the Critical Care Grand Rounds, and the one thing that is very, very different from what I'm calling the curse, that is the COVID inflammatory response. Obviously, one is that it's a thromboinflammatory process. But more importantly, there is an undulating pattern of release of uh, cytokines reflected in um, increasing and decreasing inflammatory markers. And we've got patients now for 38, 40, 45 days, and you can still see the D dimers the ferritin and uh, some of the CRP go up and down, uh, not as much as that initial burst, but these small bursts continue uh, to last over five, six weeks. And that may be, uh, you know, the problem that, you know, you took care of that initial burst, but then it, you know, there's recidivism there and that's a problem. That's a really important point because it gets to this issue about whether, how long and how intensively to continue anticoagulant or some other antithrombotic strategy when the patient seems to be getting better, when they leave the ICU, and then, of course, later when they leave the hospital. And right. I think, Andy, you had an approach to this in the protocol, um, which was to continue more intensive anticoagulation as people who um, leave the ICU and go back out to the wards uh, before uh, reducing the intensity. Comment on that? Um, sure. Well, for a, it's a, it's a two-week extension of the treatment dose anticoagulation. I mean, obviously, if somebody has a documented firm DTE, DVT or PE, you're going to treat them for a standard duration, which if it's a very highly reversible situation like COVID and now they're walking again, three months might do it. Um, but if it's empiric full dose anticoagulation, our protocol calls for an extending for two weeks after the ICU or two weeks after they go home. Okay. And so you see here um, the, uh, what, what is recommended in the Pro Mount Sinai protocol for patients who did develop a venous thromboembolic event, whether a DVT by duplex ultrasound, pulmonary embolism is assessed by CT angiography or other means. But if it's confirmed, uh, treatment doses either um, usually with an oral agent and the pixaban or rivaroxaban, I think, were recommended because the trials leading to the approval of these two of the NOACs uh, for patients with VTE did not involve uh, heparin warfarin bridging. It went directly uh, to these drugs, and then and so there was no need for a intermediate step. Um, and of course, when re renal function is impaired, rivaroxaban is really not a possibility. So that le either leaves you with a pixaban or a heparin because low molecular weight heparins are problematic there. And as, as mentioned, uh, three months of therapy, but it may be even longer in certain patients where there may be ongoing risks. And defining those risks has been um, addressed to some extent in, in non-COVID uh, medically ill patients that we'll get to 
in, in just a few minutes. So anything else on this protocol, Andy, before we move on? I have yep. a question for Andy, Umesh. Yes. Sure. Andy, I know that you were tracking intracranial hemorrhages because we've spoken about some of those patients, but there are a couple of other catastrophic bleeding events that I'm not sure whether you're uh, getting from the front lines. One of them is we've had two patients with spontaneous retroperitoneal bleeds, one unilateral and one bilateral without any groin procedures. And that led to a hypotension and ATN with AKI. And the other, you know, we are doing pretty aggressive tracheostomies. And a lot of these patients are getting bleeding around the trachs. And on the 12th of May, we had a code where the bleeding led to clotting, uh, you know, just below the tip of the uh, tracheostomy tube. And the patient had to be coded. So these are bleeding events, which I don't know if you're tracking or not. Yeah, I mean, I think that's such a good point. Uh, we, we're, we are trying. Scott Nowakowski in IR sends me every day on uh, IR you know, or, or body imaging that shows you know, major bleeding. So I believe the you know, one you mentioned was caught. And we are looking for a report on PAC cells to see if, um, you know, um, the impact on just transport as a marker, plus, of course, mortality, which is ultimately what we're trying to improve. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Dr. Fuster has um, get, uh, led a, an initiative that's gathering lots of information about what's happening with the patients in the hospital. Uh, uh, Dr. Fuster, if you would comment, this is from a preliminary report in the search correspondence published in JAK um, that looked at patients at Mount Sinai. Uh, this was a relatively small segment of the entire population, but still a much larger experience than had been uh, reported heretofore. Uh, by others. So, Valentin, well, let, let me start by saying that uh, I have to give thanks to uh, four or five people Girish, Natkarni, Sahi Fayat, Emilia Vajela, and Anulala, and certainly Carlos Cordon, too, who uh, got uh, to me about uh, five weeks ago and they said, Can you really look at all this situation of anticoagulation? and so forth. So I took, uh, I took the task uh, seriously, and basically there are six phases. Phase one was uh, from March uh, 15 to March the 30th, where were 2,000 patients admitted. And at that time, autopsy material from, from China was beginning to point out that thrombosis was important, and we had already a couple of papers in Jack about that. And it became clear that this was a thrombotic phenomenon. This actually, at that time, is when the first policy or guideline evolved uh, with uh, very low dosages of heparin and apixaban and so forth. It was very prophylactic. But then we said, let's go into stage three and look at what happened in the patients were about 3,000 between the mid of March and mid of April. And, and this was an observational study, of course, but at that time I refused personally to get engaged into any trial because I didn't know the question. I didn't know what dosages to use. I didn't know about hemorrhages. So I decided to just look at these 3,000 people. And actually, uh, this is basically what we found. We found three things. Overall, when we look at the multivariate analysis and 10 variables were involved here, uh, we found that anticoagulation was slightly better than non-anticoagulation in mortality, uh, short term in the overall group. But the group that was very striking was the group that was mechanically uh, actually addressed in which the difference between anticoagulation and no anticoagulation was very significant. Since that time, we now working in 6,500 patients and I can tell we have still to to give the final, final statistical analysis, but look, things look very similar. Having said that, then the group of intensive care and anesthesiologists, actually, uh, they came up with uh, data on a matching of 300, 200 patients who underwent mechanical uh, ventilation, and I'm reviewing the paper with them at the present time. And what is very interesting, they find significant difference between anticoagulants that were at the therapeutic dose versus no anticoagulants or anticoagulants at a low dose. And I have the paper in front of me reviewing it now. It's from our group here and so forth. But I have to make a third comment and a fourth comment. The third comment is that 
we then look at the different antithrombotic agents. And I will tell you again, we have now to validate this in the 65,000 patients and 50, uh, 6,500 with uh, Emilia. And, and what we find is that subcutaneous heparin, uh, I'm talking about enoxaparin, not, not unfractionated heparin at a, at a high dose. And then uh, NOAX, interestingly, are of significant benefit compared with intravenous heparin and 5,000 units uh, unfractionated heparin subcutaneously. This is now being looked at, multivariable analysis and so forth. I suspect with intravenous heparin, it's very difficult to check the APTTs in these units. So there is a little a bit question. And then the other aspect is uh, Anulala, actually, uh, is the patients come back 4%. We look at that and there is a trend in favor of anticoagulation at this moment with the first 3,500 that did not were admitted to the hospital readmitted versus those who were readmitted. This is now a trend and now we have 6,500 6, patients that we are undergoing. Meantime, uh, we'll have some data on the 6,500 within a week. Meantime, I began to develop a trial. I have been in touch with NIH. I have been in touch with Sanofi, University of Toronto, and ourselves in the last four days. And I will tell you the approach that we are taking is asking three questions. The first question is going to be depending on what we get from the 6,500 uh, 6, patients. Are we going to treat patients with two uh, in the most sickest patients in the unit, uh, CCUs with subcutaneous heparin plus a pixaban versus a cutaneous heparin alone. Let's see the incidence of bleeding that we are waiting for. Second question, are the patients going to be discharged in subcutaneous heparin versus a pixaban? And the approach is three months. And the third approach is to, what about those patients who are coming to the hospital are COVID positive, but they go home, the mildest one. And here we are debating at this minute a pixaban versus subcutaneous heparin versus placebo. I'm just only tell you, giving a sense of what is going on. All what we have done is what we wanted to do, and that is to go into a trial when we know something about it. And I think we are learning about dosages, we are learning about bleeding, and I think we are now ready to really undertake what is the final, final answer, which is prospective studies. Thank you. That, that was terrific. Uh, anyway, I think you, you have made a very important point, and I've spent the last 25 years working in the area of anticoagulation and antithrombotic therapy, and the single most important lesson I have learned is that you need to not only choose the correct agent to study, but you need to understand dosing. Uh, if you get the dose wrong, nothing will work. And so you, this is really a crucial component and probably one of the most valuable uh, outcomes of these observational data is to guide us a bit in understanding dose intensity. Obviously, we don't have yet randomized trial data to really give us what we want to. I'm having trouble to advance the slide. Let me see if I can. Oh, no. There we go. Uh, these data, by the way, just coming from a report not yet published in, unless it happened today in blood. Andy Dunn showed this to me yesterday. Uh, this is patients who were already on antithrombotics before hospitalization. And as you can see, it really did not have um, much impact there. So the problem, of course, is always with all of observational data is how comparable are the patients uh, coming into the study? And to what extent are we seeing decisions having been made for anticoagulation that might actually indicate a higher risk group? So that's the problem. And let me just tell you before we get into research, and here's where I'm going to ask Vivek Reddy to help us uh, in just a few moments, is the challenges that we are facing. And the problem, of course, is that we're trying to acquire evidence, or at least when the, the, the issue was taken up, during a, a really a hor horrible pandemic of a completely new, unprecedented lethal disease. And we have, there, there are challenges to observational studies. What are the comparators? It's hard to use historical controls when the clinical landscape is changing very rapidly. The value of observational studies is greatest when the outcomes are uniform and well-known. In something like Ebola, where everybody dies and there is no real treatment, then you know, observational studies might be useful. But it's very difficult to interpret these studies when many patients are asymptomatic or recover spontaneously. But there are, of course, challenges to randomized trials, and Dr. Fuster alluded to these. 
first and foremost from a standpoint of getting them done is they become increasingly impractical as the number of new cases decreases. They're obviously challenged, as we have just heard, by the complexities of mechanisms, intensity of therapy, dosing, uh, the intensity of the disease, and by the staffing considerations that occur when uh, patients are very ill and have risks of transmission. Uh, outcome assessment issues become very important, particularly when we consider that all treatments have potential side effects. And then in the middle of a desperate time, when, as Andy said, people are throwing the kitchen sink at every patient who was very ill with this disease, is that crossovers between treatment arms become amplified by what I call desperation and frenzy. So I'd like us, and this is where I would hope that um, Vivek will help to chime in, is, is um, let's define the patient cohorts that we want to study. Now we've talked a little bit about the inpatient and we'll come back to that. But let's begin with the outpatient in the community who has tested positive for COVID-19, it's been identified, they're antigen positive, um, and, and then we have to say, who are we going to study and what will we study? Is the symptomatic patient different than the asymptomatic patient? Do we look at D-dimer as a way of identifying a higher risk group for inclusion, or do we follow that as some kind of an outcome? What other risk factors should we consider, probably somewhat in an exploratory way? What is the appropriate intervention, and what are the appropriate endpoints? Vivek, I know you have been thinking a lot about the pre-admission patient or the non-admitted patient. Could you comment about the thoughts that you've had? Um, sure. Thanks a lot, John. Um, I'm really happy to participate in this panel. I got interested in this um, mainly from the perspective of atrial fibrillation, obviously, in the context of COVID, um, is particularly early in the, in, the, in the disease state or in the, in the pandemic, we notice a lot of AFib. Um, I think that, um, you know, you've already laid out very nicely the, the issues that one has to think about. Um, the, one of the most important, as you know, is actually having equipoise, equipoise for ourselves and particularly equipoise for our patients. Um, just before going to the outpatients, I just want to make one comment on the inpatient because I think it'll be, it's going to be very interesting to see the results of the uh, 6,500 patients because, you know, one read of the current data is that, okay, ICU patients and critically ill patients are patients where there's some um, evidence of benefit based on the observational data. But we, at this point, we, it's not clear that the non-critically ill, the non-ICU patients, uh, show any benefit. One read of that observational data is there was no difference. So um, I think, I hope that people are looking at that. Again, we'll have to see what the 6,500 patient data shows us, but because uh, I do think that's an area that, that hopefully can be studied. Anyway, with the outpatients, um, uh, again, I got it very interested in this because of AFib. Um, and there's certainly, I, I think, a few things that I would just comment beyond what you said are, the issue of, uh, of antiplatelet agents and anti-inflammatory agents. I mean, I think in any trial that, that's uh, designed, we have to probably take into account the fact that views are gonna, views may be changing and they probably will change in terms of the role of anti-inflammatory agents and um, uh, earlier in the disease process and how that may affect um, the thrombotic response also. Um, I think the other important issue is how do you even uh, power for, an al or for studies like this? Because the event rates are so unknown at this point, and, uh, and you, know, you, can, you can imagine a 30% or a 40% or 50% treatment effect, but um, what exactly are the events going to be? If you're looking for things like stroke or pulmonary embolism, we're going to need a lot of patients to prove that that's actually going to be effective. It may be that the benefit of antithrombotics may actually be in affecting oxygenation, affecting you know sort of microthrombotic um, effects in the lungs, and that we may be looking at delayed time to um, to resolution of uh, of symptoms. So I think how you actually um, decide on the endpoints is much more complicated than in perhaps the inpatient um, antithrombotic studies. Um, and then the, the last point I think I just want to make is in terms of how you create a statistical plan for something like this, because again, we're not quite sure what the event rates are going to be, uh, depending on which one chooses. 
it probably makes sense to either think about doing randomized unpowered studies or doing some sort of a uh, some sort of a, a Bayesian design where we look at groups of data and use that to, to determine how many additional patients, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's, it's definitely going to be challenging, particularly at a time when if the public starts hearing about antithrombotics in hospitals, they're going to be wondering about whether or not they will, uh, uh, you know, randomize in a, in a trial like this. Absolutely right. And, you know, and those are all terrific points. And the other thing that's happening in this field is that uh, things like antiviral interventions, perhaps anti-inflammatory interventions, as you mentioned, may be most effective early in the course of the disease. And then we need to consider interactions between certain antivirals and certain antithrombotics that'll make uh, dosing and uh, management and crossovers particularly challenging. When, when you um, move beyond the outpatient into the hospitalized patient, obviously we distinguish the critically ill from those who are hospitalized and at risk of respiratory decompensation. In, in the case of the Sinai protocol, it's distinguished based on being in the wards versus the ICU. What are the endpoints that we should be looking at? Dr. Fuster, I know talking about developing a trial, presumably that trial would focus on the inpatient uh, population. What are the endpoints? Is it mechanical ventilation or is that an eligibility criterion? Is it a threshold of illness? Um, again, you need to consider what other risk factors, which would largely be exploratory in identifying a high risk cohort to target. Um, what should the interventions be? Should they be a broad spectrum approach or something which is target specific? Is there an anticoagulant alone or should we look at combinations? Um, and what are the endpoints? Survival, is it venous thromboembolism? Are there surrogates for this or are there other potential endpoints? So uh, maybe I could ask Dr. Fuster if you have comments about what your thinking might be about how to design a trial? Well, we, we are waiting for the 6,500 uh, patients uh, data we're getting at this moment, as, as uh, Vivek mentioned. And uh, the sense that I'm, in, in, that I'm getting, again, is the sense that uh, uh, NOAX may be of interest here. Maybe of interest in the sickest patients, if the hemorrhage incidence is not significantly higher mm -hmm. with the subcutaneous heparin uh, at high dose. I really feel that one arm could be subcutaneous heparin uh, already in the hospitalized patient, even not necessarily in the CCU with a, a, a therapeutic dose. And the other arm could be in um, maybe a subcutaneous heparin at a lower dose with a NOAC and maybe those who are mechanically treated, then to use both in therapeutic dosages. Mm -hmm. This obviously is a, a key uh, to, to get the date of this uh, 6,500 is critical because we will know about the dose that has been used and we will know about bleeding. So everything I'm telling you at this moment is a little bit intuitive of what I am learning. That's, that's the way I would handle these groups of patients. Those in the hospital, in those who actually not only are in the hospital but are mechanically treated. And what I think is very important, and actually there are places now, uh, even in New York City, where trials have been ongoing or they started before having this data available between, for example, prophylactic dose versus intensive therapy, treatment dose, uh, low molecular weight heparins, and they're getting into trouble because of crossovers and stuff when we really didn't have sufficient information going in. So I think you're absolutely right about that. But let me just add, turn to the third and final component, which is what do we do when the patient goes home? And just quickly to summarize, we have data on medically ill patients from five trials involving the NOx, different comparators, uh, meaning some cases was placebo, some cases was low molecular weight heparin. But there's a message, and the primary outcome in these trials was the combination or the, or the uh, uh, both of the, the combined endpoint of symptomatic venous thromboembolism or venous thromboembolism related death. And the overall finding was yes, these no in varying intensities uh, lower this endpoint, even against enoxaparin in some cases, most recently the large Mariner trial. 
but there is a price to be paid in terms of bleeding that causes us to to go down in terms of the intensity of therapy. For example, in Mariner, Rivaroxaban was given at 10 milligrams daily, which is much less than the usual treatment dose, and even lower at 7.5 milligrams daily if there was renal impairment, uh, moderate renal impairment. So we have some data in the medically ill. This is not the COVID population. And the question is whether we should employ this as was recommended in the Mount Sinai uh, protocol because I think this is the final one, which is what do we do with the patient who has survived hospitalization, goes home. If they had a deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism, we've already discussed they need to be treated with full intensity for a minimum of three months. But what do we do if the patient did not develop a known venous thromboembolic event? Should we do a trial that looks here at patients of a NOAC versus a low molecular weight heparin? What is the intensity? Could there be a role for warfarin or is there even a role for dual pathway inhibition, a compass-like regimen with low intensity anticoagulation and antiplatelet? So I'd like to hear from anyone on the panel who'd like to comment about this as a uh, final uh, part of the discussion and then we can open for questions. John, can I ask you one thing? Um, yeah. Do we have any idea what the uh, prevalence of venous thromboembolism is in discharged patients? I don't think so. I think it's an important component. Uh, you know, if they don't get looked at in the hospital, then we have to rely on the trials like Mariner, Magellan, ADOPT, the, uh, the APEX trial that I just showed you on the preceding slide, where we know that the patients who were older and the patients that had elevated D-dimers at the time of discharge from the hospital were the ones who gained the most benefit from extended duration anti uh, thrombo uh, thromboembolic prophylaxis. And the question has really not been answered is what is the actual incidence of verified venous thrombosis in this patient population in particular? John, I have a comment here, and this is history. Any study in the past of people, for example, venous thrombotic disease, I still remember 15 years ago, a spontaneous venous thromboembolism we were treating patients for a month and then what we learned in these diseases when there is a pro-clotting activity they last much longer and now we are treating three months or even forever mm -hmm. i personally think that when we go into the discharge patients and certainly if a new lala's work confirms that the readmission rate certainly the trends are in favor of not being readmitted when those who are anticoagulants i really think should be a long term long term I think it's about uh, about three months. Whether you use a NOAC versus subcutaneous heparin and so forth, I think that's to be seen. But what I think very strongly is that we are going to do something on antithrombotic therapy in this patient should be longer term, not just a couple of weeks. Okay. And John, if I could just add one comment. Yes, please. Um, sure. So I just, um, just so everyone's very clear, I think there's three groups of patients who go home. You have patients who had a confirmed DVT or PT, you know, treat them for three months, often longer if they have continued risk factors. Patients who got empiric treatment dose, where our protocol calls for two weeks after uh, discharge. And then lastly, everybody else. So patients who are going home had severe COVID, did not get treatment dose. Mariner Apex suggests uh, some benefit in terms of symptomatic events. It's probably less than 1% uh, that is offset by you know, clinically relevant non-major bleeding or major bleeding of about the same, roughly the same magnitude. I think if anything, COVID patients are probably a lot more inflamed and higher risk than patients who are in those groups, just because what we've seen experientially. Um, so the prophylactic dose uh, for the 35-day regimen as FDA approved is a very reasonable consideration. I think it might be reasonable at that point to check D-dimer, make sure it stays suppressed before you stop. And after you stop, let a couple of weeks go by or a week or two, and then, and then check D-dimer again, make sure it's not going up. Because if nothing else, that means there is active intravascular thrombosis. So with that, let me stop the formal portion. And we certainly have a minute or two, I hope, for anyone that would like to comment that's a, 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 either on the panel John, or listening. John, let me, it says, uh, Vivek, let me just make yeah. one quick comment. Um, I think it would also be very useful, particularly for the last um, category of, um, of, of discharge patients, to try to understand, you know, to do an observational study, a careful observational study before embarking on a randomized trial. One, because you need to know event rates, but also because you need to make a decision on whether or not it's worth it. You know, yeah. in the sense yeah. that 
um, there's a lot of interesting stuff with COVID, important questions that need to be answered. And frankly, we don't have time to do all these trials. That's for sure. Um, and if the event rates are in the same range as what you see in the post-discharge hospitalization patients, where you're exactly. talking trying to reduce 1% to you know, half a percent, mm -hmm. that may not be the most important thing that we deal with first. Yeah, I agree. I think tar identifying the higher risk cohort, which is what was found in a secondary analysis of several of these trials, the, the improved score or other things that really identify people who stand to gain the most benefit. Can I ask a question about a, uh, a patient? Mm -hmm. I'd like to take away from this hour, which is an excellent discussion, a patient, 85, who uh, has had uh, fibrin splits that started in 19,000 and are down to 3,000 now. And we started getting nervous with all this discussion about clotting. He's had uh, three negative workups for pulmonary emboli. Uh, and we have no evidence that's the source, so we put him on a NOAC uh, five days ago uh, just to guide him down to a normal uh, uh, fibrin split, and he uh, uh, had a hematemesis of four units of blood on a NOAC. Uh, and can I summarize from what I hear that the best thing is to send him out on uh, an oxyparin the next three months? I don't think we know the answer to that. Uh, Andy, you might have a comment because you've worked in this area. Um, sure. I think the patient whose objective tests were negative, correct? He's come, his, he had a, a CRP, came down from 30 to 5. His ferritins are still elevated. He's clearly drifting down uh, to a more normal uh, a split uh, ferritin. Right. So the issue is. Do we dare put him just on a discharge in oxaparin? He's ready to go in a day or two. Uh, he's feeling yeah, fine he, otherwise. He, but, yeah, if he, he responds and improved with the anticoagulation, I'd probably give him at least four weeks of an OAC. It's just to take. I mean, if he has a significant leak, then I I, I a part. So I, I have to you, tell him that. You give him NOAC again? It, it, de it depends on what on and what he bled. If he had a bleeding event recently, I'd on it in the first place. Yeah, a major melanotic bleed. Yeah. After well, getting I, dizzy I, for the panel oh. may have a different opinion. I, I'd be I, I, I would give a Pixaban. Um, a Pixaban short acting. There is reversal agents for it. Um, it's probably the safest as far as bleeding is concerned. And uh, that, that's how I would approach this. You, you wouldn't keep giving the subcutaneous heparin? You mean like a low molecular weight Nox, heparin? Noxapran, low molecular weight, yeah. I, I don't think I would. Okay. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I mean... I... <laughs> right or wrong, I need the right one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Marty, we'll turn the, let me turn the agenda back to you now. I Thank think you. we're coming to the end of the time. Dr. Goldman? I'd like to ask a question of the panel. Um, thanks for a terrific conversation um, and discussion. My particular uh, interest is in the possibility that inhaled and nebulized uh, can people mute the supplementation biscuits? Can people mute their phones, please? We just have a few minutes left, and it's very distracting. Thank you. My, my, my question uh, is whether nebulized heparin, perhaps in combination with humixed and albuterol, as has been advocated by a very small number of centers, and has been used in the past with mixed success for burn victims, inhalation victims, and in some cases, pediatric uh, um, asthma crisis, whether that might be peculiarly useful in COVID. As Vivek commented, uh, and, and everyone's been on this theme, this is a pro-coagulant uh, problem. It manifests early with hypoxemia, even well before the time when we see fibrotic uh, change in the lungs and, and increased airway pressures. If this really is a microvascular pulmonary thrombotic problem, would inhaled heparinoids, uh, perhaps in combination with mucomist or albuterol, even prior to intubation, uh, be a useful therapy. 
You know, it's interesting you mentioned this. Both Andy and I were sent an email uh, asking about this. Um, uh, there's, there's a company that is looking into this, and there are some antiviral properties to heparin. The issue is um, you just spray it, and it just disappears in a minute, or is it absorbed into the nasal mucosa? No one knows. So um, you know, I, I guess I would have to know what the properties of it are if you're using uh, an intranasal form of it. What do you think, Andy? We, we gave yep. some yesterday to yep. a desperately ill patient in the ICU, just nebulized down the ET tube. Uh, you know, the patient's getting nebulized medications anyway. We added to that 5,000 units of nebulized heparin, uh, added to their baseline nebulizers, um, following a protocol that has become standard of care in the Emory University ICUs. Frankly, I think largely without an evidence base, but um, I think tempered or guided by their experience with burn patients. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we have no real data here, and I, I can tell you that anecdotal, anecdotally, the Emory folks are reporting a better ICU survival than we have had um, here in, in New York, uh, but that's not peer-reviewed or published either. Um, so, you know, there's not a good evidence base, but on the other hand, um, if we believe the pathophysiologic mechanism begins with pulmonary capillary thrombosis before fibrosis of the airway, perhaps a nebulized inhaled heparinoid, which has some other antiviral properties, as you know, N-acetylcysteine has been touted to have as well, perhaps that could be um, given early or even later in the course of the disease we know it has very little impact on systemic PTTs or any coagulation levels, does not bring with it a significant bleeding risk. And of course, whenever we're thinking of anticoagulant therapy, we always have to weigh the risk of bleeding versus the benefit of anticoagulation. This particular route of administration might perhaps give us a better efficacy with fewer systemic bleeding complications. Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely right for research for certain. And of course, it doesn't protect against venous thromboembolism, but it may have a direct favorable effect in the pulmonary system. Absolutely. It would not be a systemic uh, therapy. This would be a pulmonary directed therapy. Um, I have a quick, quick practical question, Pedro Moreno here. Outpatient, not sick enough, positive D dimer. Do we do NOx or not? Nobody knows. We. We talk about the fact that we, a lot of people are doing it. We don't yet know whether it's going to have a favorable outcome because most of these people get better anyway. Thank you. Well, uh, it's Eric Stern, a comment about what Dr. Puskas was speaking of. I think it's a different matter whether the patient is intubated and it's a closed circuit, or you're just talking about inhaled nebulized material and someone is COVID positive in terms of risk to others, particularly staff. John, do you want to just make some closing comments? And then um, should people refer uh, questions specifically about their patients uh, to you and Andy Dunn moving forward? So uh, let me just summarize, first of all, by thanking the panel. Um, we, we really had a great group of people here who all brought, I think, important insights to the discussion. I want to thank Dr. Fuster for the work that he's doing to help us get moving toward clinical trials in a logical and sequential fashion. I'm certainly happy to take questions. I'm sure Dr. Dunn is as well. Um, anyone can feel free to reach out to me, um, and I'll, I'll pass all the hard questions to Dr. Olin. Me too. Again, um, uh, can I just ask uh, Dr. Reddy if he's still on the phone? Do you want to make some comments specifically about the atrial fibrillation uh, increased incidence that you're seeing? And do they warrant short term or is COVID a new risk factor that gives them long time therapy? I'd love to hear your opinion and Dr. Halpern's. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're analyzing that right now. The fellows have been going through this very carefully. Um, I think it's a little too early to, to answer, um, Marty, but I, I guess the one thing I'll say is we are not seeing okay, some dramatic close. increase in strokes in AF patients, which is what I had expected to see. Whether or not yeah. that will actually bear out once we finish the analysis, we'll see. So just stay tuned. I hope by middle of next week we'll have an answer.
Dr. Yeah. Fisk or Dr. Halpern, do you think COVID-related AFib requires short-term or is it a new CHADS-VAS COVID risk factor? I, I would say that, you know, I think inflammation in general is a provocateur of atrial fibrillation and possibly of thrombogenesis in the atrium, but we don't have the data to know and we certainly don't know how long lasting that state would be. So I don't think based on what we know today, that I would utilize COVID in the way that we would say hypertension or heart failure as a, a ticket to a long-term commitment to anticoagulant therapy in patients with atrial fibrillation if there were no other indication. My comment is that we really need more observational studies. Despite of being criticized, I can tell you, they provide a lot of background of what we should do. And we, ne we have more questions than answers at this moment. Thank you all very much. Thank Excellent. you, Dr. Fuster, Dr. Halpern, Dr. <laughs> Reddy, uh, Dr. Olin, Dr. Dunn. Um, thank you all uh, very much for really a fascinating, fascinating conference. Uh, wish you all a happy weekend. Uh, be well, be safe. Thank you. <laughs>